Welcome to the Pin Leader Podcast, where strategic leaders get straight to the topics, strengthening our awareness and sharpening our minds. The Pin Leader Podcast is produced by Roar, a production division of Maze and Associates LTD. Find out more at www.maysassociatesltd.com. Now here is your award-winning host, Dr. Shan DeGore. Welcome back to the Pin Leader Podcast. And today we're going to be talking about making our money work. And I'm excited to have a guest with me who has over 20 years experience working in the financial services industry. She is a financial advisor. Uh, she has a bachelor's of organizational development and business, a master's in business administration and Excited to have with me Jennifer Pansition. Welcome, Jennifer, to the show. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Excellent. So, well, let's get right into this. You know, when we talk about futures and funding our monies and putting our money somewhere, can you talk a little bit about your experiences with your 20 years of helping others grow their wealth? Yeah. So I, I've been in the business, like you said, over 20 years, and I have been very fortunate that I've been surrounded by people at my at a really young age to get me interested in the finance world. So the ability to help people become financially independent is very, very important to me because it allows them to make choices that they normally wouldn't have. So I like to work with clients from all different ages. Um, I even like to, you know, my, my established clients where their kids are starting to graduate from college and they need a little bit of help. I will take them on as clients as well because I love to be able to start to build that base for them. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic the way it's evolved over the last 20 years as well, right? I mean, it used to be a, a service of where we pick the best mutual funds in, in the best stocks, which we still do, but we have a lot of chassis that help us do that. But it's the other pieces of financial advising that um, matter. And that's, you know, like a return on life. That's a really big, important piece for me. And, you know, that means like what is most important to my client? Retiring is usually one of the number one things but for some folks that doesn't always necessarily want to be their number one, right? Depending on their point of their life. So, and some of it could be funding kids' colleges, right? I mean, that's important too. So I always want to know what my client's best goal is, what their most important goal is, and then we build from there. Well, talking about leading money, leading your money, making your money work for you. You know, we're seeing these numbers. These are really big numbers. $84 trillion transferring of wealth into the next two generations. I saw that that Edward Jones was reporting some of that information and that women will inherit $30 trillion of that. So that has, DEI has been a really big piece for Edward Jones for the last several years. I'm very fortunate that I have a volunteer role with Edward Jones, that I am the DEI market leader, which covers 14 different regions. And that is for me to help assist with our other financial advisors when they're looking to grow their practice, making sure they're looking to grow it in the correct way. So if they're adding financial advisors, right, what makes the most sense? You know, we want to make sure that we're giving everyone the opportunity to, to take a look at Edward Jones and have have the opportunity to be a financial advisor. So it is my job to help get out there and spread the awareness, providing them with a place to be, providing them with assets in order to start their practice and making sure we're supporting them all the way through. Because right now, 51% of the population is women, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. People like to sit across the table from pe other people that look just like them. Not only that, but it, it's all about the client, right? Every client deserves to sit across the table from a financial professional that they can resonate with. So that is really important to our firm. Well, when we talk about leadership, that's a critical part of like, well, how do you look for leaders? What are the characteristics? Because you're obviously very passionate about this. Yeah. I would guess a passion, but can you talk first about your passion and then, you know, what is it that you're looking for in leaders to help you help others with their money? Yeah, that's a great question. So the thing with leadership is, you can be an introvert, you can be an extrovert, and you can still be very good at this job. This is not a sales job. This is a job of being able to get to know some, uh, get to know people and have passion to give them and do what's best for them. That's what that's about. And leadership is recognizing talent mm -hmm. and then effectively giving them the tools to utilize it. I think that's probably one of the most important things. It's not an easy transition, right? Most women take a little longer to make that decision that they're going to leave a career. Statistically, men will be the first one to say, you know what, I've never done that job, but I'm gonna do it anyway. 
where women are be a little bit more more studying before they make the decision to come aboard. Um, and we know that. So the runway is a little bit longer and when we're working with other, you know, with individuals like that. So the other part of leadership is inspiring them to do their best, right? Which is emotional intelligence, which we hear a lot about. I hear that word being pushed around a lot, right? Yes. Yeah. It has a lot of different meanings. One of the big quotes that I have is personal humility with a will. Mm. How do you inspire others to lead a cause? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. I think that's really important in leadership. I have, um, I am a founder of a nonprofit and very passionate about domestic violence as well. And we started the nonprofit in 2015. And my goal was always to give back to the community. So we worked with the community, the, the sheriff's departments and the service departments out there, right? And I, my goal at the end of it was once I knew that our nonprofit was sustainable for the next two years, I was giving it back to the community and I was walk, I was coming off the board. Mm-hmm. And I was able to do that. And I was able to do that because the people that were surrounding me on that board had the same sort of passion for the cause. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't just me. Yes, I'm the one that was the starter of it, but I, I, we, we built a team as we pulled one or two people in and we just continued to build that team in the right direction. They're running it. They're doing a fantastic job. They've had a lot of really good results out of it. And in fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attend a board meeting um, on uh, next Friday <laughs> that I haven't been to in over a year. So I'm, I'm super excited, but that is leadership at its finest, right? Yeah. Yeah. Again, it is that personal humility with a will. Yes. You know, you're one of the few individuals I know that has, again, started a nonprofit, but has the desire to step back and say, you all, I trust your leadership. Go ahead and run this nonprofit. And if you need my help, I'll be over here to the side. But that's exciting because sometimes it's hard to let go. Yeah. You know what? It it really wasn't hard for me to let go. I was, once I hit about year seven, I was really starting to look for my succession plan. And I think that's the other part of, of financial advising, right? Is that succession plan. What does that look like for you financially? For me in the nonprofit is what was my succession plan so that I was teeing it up. So it looked like the way I wanted it to look when I, when I, when I was able to be done with it. Right. Mm-hmm. And so that gets tied hand in hand again, effective leadership, that's effective financial planning, right? I wasn't going to, I was not willing to come off of or step away from the nonprofit without it being sustainable for at least two years, right? Mm-hmm. So again, that's all financial planning and setting myself up and the nonprofit and then helping that just feeds right over to my clients, right? We want to have a, what is your goal? What is your dream? What are we going after? And what are we going to do to put it in place? Now, that doesn't mean you can't, you don't have to pivot because there's a lot of pivoting going on when you're building a master plan, right? right. And that's, that's another part of key part of leadership, right? Mm -hmm. Is being able to pivot Mm -hmm. and being able to pivot with respect and candor that matters, right? I mean, because you have to be able to go back to your people, whether it's your clients, it's your nonprofit, it's your, your, your employees with things that are hard. Market's been rough the last two years, going back to my clients with that type of you know, let's sit down and talk about it because your opinion matters and your feelings matter. Let's talk about it. We can't change it, but we can change mindset and we can start to pivot to see if we need to do something different so we're still reaching your goals at the end. So that's that's a great segue into if I had money, we'll just say person A has $5,000 or they're thinking to themselves, I, if I put $5,000 away or if I squirrel away somewhere, $5,000, or what would you suggest? Because again, some people think in tens of thousands, but it takes hard, it's hard enough to save funds. Yeah. So, I mean, we never talk about product. Product is not a thing when it comes to financial planning. Mm-hmm. And again, it's fin- figuring out where you're at now, where do you want to be? What have you done so far? And what makes the most sense? So we really don't talk about product. We, we talk about building your passion. At the end, the product is a result. Mm-hmm. So, and I don't look at dollar amount. My, my clients that have $5,000 versus my clients that have $3 million, they all deserve to have a, a financial advisor that has interest in them, mm. which is part of the reason why I brought on another financial advisor. My practice has grown tremendously and I'm so thankful for that and grateful. But the client that's got the $5,000 still deserves to have a financial advisor that has time to spend with them, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's the whole progression of growing my, growing my impact, Mm -hmm. growing my financial practice is that. So this comes down to anyone with monies that are looking around and some might be more suspicious of like, well, where do I, who can I trust? And I think you're talking about that building that relationship and how critically important it is to build the relationship so that people can trust, right? Can you explain a little bit about what you would suggest for those that are saying, I'm not sure if I trust or how do, how would someone go about finding someone and how would they go about trying to figure out how to invest in their future? Yeah, it's a great question. And trust is, is a hundred percent of what I do, right? You have to, if I'm going to be your financial advisor, you have to trust me. 
So if I'm getting a referral or a prospect is calling in and I'm meeting with them, I spend 45 minutes with them just talking again about their goals, where they're at, where they're going, what they've done to get there, right? And I will tell them at the end of the conversation, if I'm the right fit for you, then we can talk about you hiring me at, a, at our next meeting when I put together your goals and your plans, right? Mm -hmm. Because just because I'm very good at my job, which I am, doesn't necessarily mean that I'm a right fit for you. Mm -hmm. The other part for me, of, oh, I've always done for my clients, they have my cell phone, which is crazy. I know, it's crazy. <laughs> I get it all the time. However, I've never had anyone abuse it. Because I want, if someone's calling me, or some, if an emergency happens on a Saturday afternoon, and they need to get a hold of me because they just had a major life change, I need them to get a hold of me. If I can't answer, I can't answer, and I let them know that I will call you back the very next day. I mean, I can't be, I, I'm not 100% always available. However, I want you to have that security that I am. The other part of this is if some, if a financial advisor tells you that you have to move right now, that you have, that you got to do it right now, mm -hmm. that's a red flag. Oh, there's okay. zero reasons why you would ever have to make a decision right now with financial planning. There just isn't. It, it, it took you 20 years to get in front of a financial planner. Wait, waiting another two weeks is not going to ch change what you've done. <laughs> just not. Another two weeks of waiting. So when people are watching, they're watching the news and they're getting a little panicked about, well, you know, I see this dip. I, I'm not sure. And again, trust, right? Right. What do you suggest for individuals who have this investment in, I could be stocks, it's different products out there, but they're seeing a dip or they've lost something in their portfolio. What do you normally suggest? Call your financial advisor. Your financial advisor should be calling you. Having those conversations. The other thing is I will tell everybody, turn the news off. <laughs> Just turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> because it's not a moment in time, right? It's not, mm -hmm. it's not, it's not the hour. It's, it's the, it's the long-term planning and your relationship with your financial advisor should have teed that up for you right from the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to have the, those dips in the market. You're going to have, again, life changes. I mean, something happens, you have a life event. You know, if someone loses their job, you have an unexpected death, right? Those are things you can't control. We cannot control the market. We can only control the way that we react to it. It's not the dips in the market. It's the life events in you should be able to have a conversation with your advisor at any given time. If you need, you know, something's really bothering you, you just need that reassurance to be able to call them. The other thing with your advisor too is, you know, it's not just the advisor, right? I work with a, ton, a lot of attorneys. I work with a lot of CPAs to get the best plan for my clients. Sometimes people do think if I go to my financial advisor, they are working alone and they're just, they're working the numbers and then they call and say, we'll do this, do this. And they don't realize there's a whole team. Or if they do have a financial advisor and that person is working alone, that might be time to really rethink your financial advisor because it does take more. It almost takes a village. <laughs> it absolutely does. And, and, your, and your advisor may be working with, you know, an attorney or CPA for you and you may not quite be aware of it, but Usually, I mean, for me, I, I'm asking my clients you, you right from the get go, who is your CPA and who's your attorney, mm -hmm. right? Let's, let's meet together to make sure we are all three on the same page for you. And it's doing exactly your plans, doing exactly what you want it to do. So give some advice on what you're seeing in a trend. You, you just mentioned about the market swinging. And so it's not, has, hasn't performed like it's performed in the past or what people might expect it to perform. What do you see with trends, especially with this? $84 trillion of transfer of wealth. Yeah. I mean, that's an amazing number. It's an amazing number. That, yes. and, and 30 trillion of it's going into the hands of women. Yes. Right? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that, right? Women live, statistically, live longer than men. They do. The other piece of this is, is that you have more women that are in the workforce now. So there, it's, it's, it, there's twofold of going on. Women have more careers, right? I mean, so it's going to be very imperative in our industry that we continue to inspire women to work with a financial advisor and continue to inspire women that are even thinking about having a career in financial advising is they get in front of someone to start learning about the trade and learning about what we do. Because we need more strong women in this in, in this trade. If someone's interested in exploring a career, what do you suggest that they do? It's not like you go, I'm looking at your degrees. You have these wonderful degrees. And my guess is that when you first started and you got done with college, maybe this wasn't the first thing you thought of or was it? No. So, <laughs> so I was very fortunate in the very beginning of, um, I was not your traditional college student. Um, I had my first, I got married at 18, had my first child at 19. Again, um, she was a game changer for me. She changed my life. It was, um, I'm so thankful that I have her. She's a very successful young lady. I'm again, my first one. And 
it was a wake up call for me that I needed to change what I was doing. I didn't want to be another statistic, right? And so I found college. And so I was working full time, had this little, little gal at home and going to school part time and <laughs> working my way through. But I had this an amazing leader. I'm just going to say his first name. It's Jeff. And he was amazing to me. He literally helped me like get my butt in college and start really expanding my world and my education world to the point he helped me get into the um, 401k plan, which I had no idea what it was. I was making $4.50 an hour in investing. Wow. Okay. And I'm so thankful for him because I had no idea, right? He did end up getting promoted multiple times and moved away. For my undergrad, um, when I graduated, my best friend brought him back to town to surprise me. Oh. It wasn't a dry eye in the house, right? That guy was so impactful. I still talk to him about every 90 days. Yeah, he, he changed my world. And so... That was part of my love for finance. It was like, wow, this is this is amazing what you can accomplish when you have control of your finances. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're a multimillionaire. What that means is, is you have a big awareness of where your money's going, how it's coming in, and how you're paying yourself. I mean, that matters because it allows you to make a lot of decisions that if you don't know what money you have, you're, you're not able to make those good decisions. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm very fortunate, right? I mean, I, I, after I graduated with my undergrad, I went back and got my master's. And then I also have my CRPC, which is my char um, chartered retirement planning counselor de designation. Then I also have an accredited behavioral financial professional designation, which that is fairly new, but that is basically about behavior and finance. Uh it's amazing. It's mm. amazing. So that was very impactful too. It, they, you know, have you heard the term mental accounting? Yes, I have. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So yeah, that comes into play and that's helpful for me. Because could you describe that a little bit too? Yeah. I think so, so people who don't know what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah. So mental accounting is basically saying, well, let's say for example, you have a hundred thousand dollars in the market, right? And it's, and it's liquid. You can get it in a couple days, or you have a hundred thousand in a savings account that's paying you zero. Mm. Well, I want that hundred thousand for safety, but I'll pull five thousand out of the money that that's making money. You still have two hundred thousand dollars in your name. That's your pot of money. But mental accounting would be, you know, probably should take it the one that's not paying you anything mm -hmm. versus the one that's paying you five. But but because you see it differently, it's that's mental accounting. So that's helpful for me as a financial advisor, right? Because I need to be able to understand what people are thinking. When I, and then I can help them see things a little differently that makes more sense for them, right? Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's still, I tell my clients all the time, it's your money. It's your money. You worked really hard for this money. So I can give you all kinds of different advice and plans. But at the end of the day, if it's not what you want, then you, it's okay. You, you get to make the final decision. What advisement, when you talk about leadership, what advisement do you have uh, if someone has a team in front of them and they could be in financial services? but they're, they could be working in another industry and they are trying to figure out where to put their money. So in other words, where do the financial advisors go to get financial advice? <laughs> well, so, yeah, we have to be continuous learners. This industry changes, I mean, on a dime. You know, we, we've been through a lot of changes in the last five years, right? Mm -hmm. uh, of just um, manage money from A share business to C share business, things like that. I mean, I'm not going to get too deep in the weeds, but yeah, we have to be continuous le learners. We do because products are changing all the time. I will tell you most of the time that products are changing, it's for the better for the consumer, mm -hmm. the majority mm -hmm. of the time. So I, it's, it behooves me to know what is going on in my finance world <laughs> in order to help my clients, right? right. It, it, sometimes we do get a little bit like the roofer where the, you know, the roofer has everybody's roofs in their neighborhood, beautiful, except for his own. But but yeah, no, that's a big deal. That and and we are, I mean, yeah, we are like pretty well scrutinized on financial. I mean, Ever wow. Jones has access to all my records, everything to make sure that I'm financially sound as well, because it does matter. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're out there considering doing the trade, like you're in a different industry, we call them um, career changers. Mm -hmm. By gosh, yes, you don't have to. You could be 40 years old and be like, you know what? I have been interested in finance my whole life, and I'd really like to dig deeper into this with what that career looks like. Yes, we love that. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering about that with even with those that want to possibly make changes. And so we're uh, at a time where individuals are changing jobs and roles and industries. 
because they're either not satisfied or they are burned out. And I hear a lot about burnout. You know, in the last part we talk about with pin leaders, the strength, being able to be straight with yourself and understanding like where you are, your qualities, being self-aware, and then being sharp, meaning again with education and experience. You know, where would you rank some of those qualities? Looking at individuals who may be in this industry or in, or seeking somebody that is in this industry. So education matters. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have a degree. That's not where the education matters. It's the continuous learning. We have a, we're in a world of if you want to know something, you can get on Google and you can probably teach yourself. If you want to learn how to change oil in your car, you can get on YouTube and do it, right? I mean, the, you, every, you have things available at your hands, right? So it's not necessarily I'm saying you got to have a degree to get started in this industry. But you have to be resilient. You have to want to care about the, the people more than you want to care about the pay, it's a great way to make a living. I'm not saying it's not, but you can't be in this business to be to, to just be ultra rich, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Because it, industry changes so much and there's so much more that we need to be giving to our clients. You know, 20 years ago, it was okay just to build a portfolio of mutual funds and some stocks and let it go. That's not the world today. It's just not. It doesn't make sense for our clients. So it's being selfless mm-hmm. to be able to give back to your clients. And you also have to be able to put down some boundaries, right? I mean, I, I say to my clients all the time, I can't care more about your retirement than you do, right? right. You, you've got to care too. And, and so let's care together <laughs> and, and make some good plans for you. That's yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So what would be the top three things that you would advise someone who has not put a dime away for retirement? What's the second and third? Yeah, that's a tough one. That's that's tough. And depending on where they're at in life, right? I mean, and it happens and it happens a lot, especially I see it more in women than anybody else. First and foremost, is it's baby steps. I always say pay yourself first. So what can we do to start, you know, building you some reserves first and reserves have to come first. You're never going to put somebody in the market until they have a good reserve three to six months of cash sitting in an account that they have for reserve. And then the next step would be, okay, you've got that. Now what's next? Do we come back to product? It's going to come back to how do we build wealth for this client that hasn't built it before, Hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can't. Sometimes you have to be able to say, listen, this is just not it. And you got to be able to say no when when it's just not there. And you got to be able to give that hard news of like, look, I don't know how to help you, right? Mm-hmm. It, that doesn't happen very often. It really doesn't. Mm-hmm. I don't really see it very often because it, it, if there's no assets, let's hope that they have some social security or they have you know some of those other things that they could do Medicaid or things like that to help them. But I don't see it very often. I think back years ago, I had a wonderful, it, she actually was a budget manager at a company that I worked at. And one of the uh, pieces that she advised me to do is put as much as you can of your check away. At that time it was stock. There was stock okay. um, being offered. But she would just say, you know, max out the match and do all that you can because you later you're you're going to benefit and I think back on that I'm really thankful because I was brand new yeah, yeah. and first time being offered a 401ks and stock and and uh, I listened to her yeah I listened to yeah. her I'm thankful for that yeah that's called pay yourself first <laughs> yeah yep that's a thing we tell them all the time pay yourself first mm-hmm. right that's awesome well I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and giving insights on not only just leadership, but also financial, making your money work and how and what people should be thinking about when they're looking for a good, solid financial advisor wherever they are in the country or in the world. Find somebody that, that has your best interests at heart. That, that's what you need to find. You got to find somebody that you connect with. Find somebody that wants to be honest with you. Find somebody that's, uh, that is a, a continuous learner because, again, our industry changes so much all the time. And, and find somebody that is looking just outside their office, right? Find somebody that's, that's open to working with those attorneys and those CPAs for you to make best decisions for you. Excellent. Well, again, thank you so much, Jennifer. I um, appreciate it so very much. And with that said, um, we thank all our listeners for tuning in and catching some word about different leadership characteristics in these different industries. Until next time. The Pen Leader Podcast is hosted by Dr. Shanda Gore and brought to you by Mace and Associates LTD, creating customized solutions for growth in the areas of leadership development, strategic planning, and culture building. Find out more at www.maysassociatesltd.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the Pin Leader Podcast and share with others.